Hello everyone. Good night. I hope you're all having a good uh, Friday night. I wanted to hop on and do a stream. I was sent the School of Life uh, video on Karl Marx, on his thinking and on his life. And oh boy, was it worse than, than I was expecting. Uh, the School of Life is, I think those videos are done by a philosopher named Alan uh, de Bottom. I believe he's a philosophy professor. So I was surprised uh, that there were that many just... Uh, glaring uh, mistakes, or at least the way that it was formulated, I would have expected uh, something a whole lot better from someone who was a professional uh, philosopher. But um, here we are. We'll talk about it a little more today. Hello, uh, Doniel uh, Lumpkins. Hello, Paramillo. How you doing? Uh, hello, Joey C. It's the weekend. What up? What's the... Yeah, it's Friday. I guess that counts. That counts. Uh, hello, Pachico Uno. Hello. Hello, Samuel Black. Uh, Samuel Black is a YouTube member, as you can see by the little logo next to uh, his name. Where's Eddie? Uh, Eddie's actually in space right now. No. Um, what's funny is that we used to say when, when people would ask me or Noah on streams, uh, where's Eddie? We used to come up with these very elaborate, uh, uh, ridiculous explanations for, for where he was. And we, we thought that at some point it'd be cool to just have a bunch of um, Photoshop pictures of Eddie, like on the moon of Eddie in a beach somewhere in Mexico or, or just Eddie in, in a bunch of random places with his face Photoshop. So that when we get asked that question, we can say, oh, he's he's doing this or uh, he's with Putin right now or something uh, ridiculous. But uh, Eddie's actually been in a tournament uh, uh, this whole weekend trying to classify for for the Olympics and wrestling uh so he should be back making uh streams sometime later this week uh hello isaiah jerry hello thank you jamie brown for the 10 bucks uh it's your donations which which keep us afloat which keep the institute afloat and you know as i'm always fond of saying really that this is the people's institute because the fight that we're waging on is is for uh for the liberation of 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 our class uh, and it's um, it's a fight. It's an investment that that's an investment in the people and in the people's struggle. What's up, Cade Grenade? Uh, what's funny is, boy, I don't give a fuck. Okay, nice. Uh, I'm about to abuse these emojis. What's up, Where Pilgrim? How's he doing? I believe he went two and two. That was the last thing, uh, uh, last time I was able to talk to him. I don't know if that means he classified or not, but um, I know that he's been cutting weight for like the last month or so, and that that's been uh, kind of tough on him and on pretty much on anyone. It's it's such a a, a difficult sport, and and making weight it's such a hard process. Such it requires uh, a great level of mental fortitude. So. Uh, I can very clearly see how he's able to take that discipline and, and work ethic and and then apply it to the work he does for, for the Institute and, and really pretty much everything in his life. He's a very uh, disciplined person with a tremendous work ethic that I think that anything that he attempts to do in his life, he ends up excelling at because of that work ethic. Um, uh Thank you, Cobra. I'm hoping to do more of these. I think that the last one that, that I did uh, reacting to one of the Intro to Marxism videos from, forget what channel it was, but it had like 2 million views. It did quite well, and I was surprised at how many uh, wrong things it had inside of it. Uh, hello, uh, Masna. Uh, oh, good question from GQ. Intersectionality versus Marxism. Is there a contradiction? I consider myself a class reductionist, unironically. Right. So this is a, a, a loaded question. And I feel like um, when it's posed uh, by people, depending on where it is that they're coming from, either from Marxism or from intersectionality, really the uh, some of the central questions, some of the central assumptions behind the question is, how is it that we're thinking about um, what are considered to be non-class struggles? So like the struggle for racial, uh, the emancipation of black people, the struggle for the emancipation of women. How are you thinking about national struggles for, for self-determination, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that 
often the the Marxist response to this hasn't been um, as correct as as it could be, and it's it's usually taken the form of well. The important thing in all of these separate struggles, whether it's the women's struggle or the race struggle or, or whatever struggle, are the universalist claims that are tied to class. Um, and I, I think that's not fully correct because the perspective that I have, which I, I think is the one that's the most in line with uh, the classics of Marxism, Marx, Engels, Lenin, uh, and it's one that's formulated uh, in this recent uh, uh, book from Domenico Lasordo relatively recent, uh, called Class Struggles, which is that when the famous dictum, the history of all hit earth or existing society is a history of class struggles, it doesn't say class struggle. There's, there's as Lasordo uh, writes, there's no such thing as a pure class struggle. Expecting there to be a pure class struggle, class struggle um, is absurd. Class struggle is a universal uh, in, in, in the history of society, and it takes necessarily various forms. And what you find in a text like The Origins of the Family, Private Property, and the State is that Engels is, uh, makes the argument that the first class struggle in history is the class struggle against uh, patriarchy, the struggle for, for women's emancipation. I think that that same lens of looking at those various struggles, which uh, greatly overlap uh, but also greatly overlap with the struggle of labor against capital, but also have uh, certain features that are its own, certain specific features that are mediated by that general struggle of labor against capital, but that ex- exists uh, in ways which cannot be reduced to the struggle of labor against capital. I, I think that those those fights, uh, the fight for black emancipation, the fight for um, national self-determination of a country, the fight for women's emancipation, the fight against racism, all of those fights are not like the separate thing that we would use the term identity politics for. They are forms of class struggle. So like the struggle for the emancipation from chattel slavery, um, where, you know, 4 million uh, black human beings were subjected to in the American South. It's absurd to to think of that as not a class struggle. When Marx is thinking of the struggle of the Irish against British colonialism, when he's thinking of the struggle of the Polish, when he's thinking of of anti-colonial struggles, he's thinking of them not as these separate things to class struggle and to the the struggle of the proletariat uh, against capitalism. He's thinking of them as interconnected uh, uh, with that struggle and as class struggles in their own right. So um, that's not to say that there isn't ways in which Bourgeois elements in those struggles uh, are the ones that are highlighted and and they end up making, you know, the struggle for like women's emancipation or the struggle against racism about diversifying uh, the the faces in high places, about making the bourgeoisie be representative of the um, racial uh, percentages of the population. So if there's like 15 percent black people in the population, make sure that the bourgeoisie is 15 percent. Uh, black and make sure that its pundits are 15% black and boom, you have the emancipation of black people. I think uh, most people can see through that sort of uh, liberal, uh, very superficial representation oriented notion of emancipation um, and uh, and realize that, you know, something more profound has to take place uh, for, for true emancipation to be achieved. But uh, to go back to the the question of intersectionality, I, I don't think intersectionality and, and Marxism are compatible. Uh, I've, I've actually written in a scholarly setting that they are, but my, my views are, are have been drastically changed uh, through the research I've done into the origins of um, the actual theorist of, of intersectionality. Uh, which come out of, again, the, the, the spaces of the PMC, of the Iron Triangle, of the media, uh, the academy, more specifically the academy and the NGOs, and uh, all of those interconnect with one another and produce uh, bourgeois ideology. And more specifically, bourgeois ideology in our age has to be an indirect apologetics of capitalism, which means that it has to be critical, it has to present itself as radical. But what it actually does, as, as Gabriel Rockhill would say, is produce a series of radical recuperators, people who end up through their 
radical lingo and radical veneer recuperating a bunch of people who are getting radicalized by the crisis of capitalism and the difficulties that they're experiencing in their everyday life. They end up recuperating them into uh, the fold of imperialism, the fold of capitalism, and becoming not a substantial uh, opposition to, to capitalism. And that's why it's actually funded and promoted through these bourgeois institutions. I've called this in my work a controlled form of counter hegemony, right? It presents itself as it's as if it's counter hegemonic, as if it's actually challenging the ruling ideas in a war of position in, in an ideological warfare. But in reality, it's just uh, serving to reinforce both those uh, ruling ideas and uh, the existing order. I think intersectionality is, is a part of that. And, you know, the uh, the difficulty arises in, in the fact that some of the references, some of the reference points that they have for their theoretical uh, development are black communist women, uh, are Claudia Jones and, and uh, Louise Thompson and um, various uh, women which have been engaged in the struggle against racism, the struggle uh, for the emancipation of labor uh, and and the struggle for the emancipation of women and they those a lot of those have came from the communist movement so there was a a book that I reviewed a while back from Ashley Bohr that was called uh, Marxism and Intersectionality and it made the argument that both are compatible um, and while they're not the same and there's parts of each tradition that is incompatible with the other. Uh, Generally, the traditions um, the traditions are compatible, and intersectionality has a lot that it owes from the tradition of Marxism and, and communist struggles. I, I I think that the, although that might be the case in terms of the appearance, you know, you have these people citing Claudia Jones and the theory of uh, triple oppression that uh, black women undergo in the U.S. because they're black uh, women and workers. Um, Although that that their some of their intellectual inspirations might be uh, those women, you know the whole essence, the the spirit that guided their theorizing, which was the struggle against capitalism, against imperialism, understanding the unique conditions of the women's struggle of the struggle against racism as forms of class struggles that have to be accounted for in their own right, that have to be studied, uh, but in a way that's always mediated by by an understanding of political economy, uh, capitalism, uh, labor relations, uh, international. Uh, uh, relations, you know, you, you can't compare that to intersectionality, which it reifies all of these different struggles and treats them as separate, right? That's the point of intersecting. Something intersects when it is not already uh, embedded in that thing with which it is intersecting with, right? The fact that they have to come and intersect um, is, uh, it shows that they're reifying all of these struggles, the struggle against racism, the women's struggle, the national struggles, class struggles, right? And class often ends up being just the last thing that they talk about, right? They usually get gender, race, and class. Um, I think that's a big mistake. I think we should see the essence of those struggles for emancipation as class struggles, right? The dictum is, uh, the history of all earth or existing society is a history of class struggles. They take various forms. Engels was clear that the women's struggle against uh, patriarchy is a form of class struggle. He says in a letter uh, to Franz Mering uh, in, I believe, uh, 1892, he says that, you know, uh, race is an economic uh, factor. It is part of the economic base, especially uh, in, in capitalist societies that are very racialized as as the, the one that we exist in in the U.S. So all of these struggles, I think they should be looked at through the lens of class struggle. And when we don't do that, not only are we limiting ourselves in the analysis of those uh, forms of emancipation, which intersectionality tries to separate from the class struggle, but likewise, when we, uh, when we fail to see the role of those as forms of class struggle, we're also... Uh, stifling the struggle of labor against capital. And this is something that you see in the Civil War very clearly. The labor movement uh, that existed in the North and, you know, the very weak one and almost inexistent one that existed in the South, it didn't consider the struggle for black emancipation as a class struggle. And so it, it produced what Du Bois called a, um, a split of the labor movement and, and it created two movements. It created on the one side the movement for free labor and free soil, 
and on the other side, the movement for abolition. And had these movements been able to come together, had these different forms of class struggles been able to come together and wage a general fight against uh, against capital, both uh, northern industrial capital and the southern oligarchy, slave oligarchy, the planter class, had they been able to do that, Du Bois says, it would have became an irresistible force. Uh, but <laughs> the labor movement didn't uh, care. The early socialist movement uh, didn't care. The only people that genuinely uh, cared were um, the the British working class, which was led ideologically by Karl Marx through the First International. And, you know, some of the remnants that were able to listen uh, to Marx, although very late in the game during the, the Civil War, people like um, uh, like Joseph Wademeyer, um, not necessarily August Willich, although August Willich was, was involved um, as a military officer in, in the Civil War for the North. But the history of the labor movement in the U.S. in the 19th century uh, ignored or was antagonistic to the question of black emancipation. And in doing so, it shot itself in the foot uh, because it had a natural ally in the struggle for, for black emancipation. And this continues well on into, into the Socialist Party uh, in the 20th century. The one party that breaks that tradition and sees the struggle for black emancipation as a form of class struggle that's fundamental uh, in the struggle of labor against capital and that general struggle is the Communist Party. Right. So uh, from the beginning, the Communist Party has has really emphasized that struggle. And it's um, it's reflected itself in, in the fact that uh, in terms of uh, membership, very early on, it was the party that was, you know, the most diverse, the one that uh, the, the black freedom movement felt at home in for, for many years. But that was uh, perhaps way too long of a of a response. Um, so I guess if, if you do consider these different struggles as class struggles, they, they would still call you a, a class reductionist, but um, that's just rhetoric, I, I think, that's uh, used to to make themselves sound more radical and to make you sound bad and uh, to reinforce the existing state of affairs. Uh, okay. Can't stay for the whole stream. Unfortunately, on my way to hang out with a lady, though. All right. Well, good luck with that, uh, Cade. So we have here another uh, super chat from Samuel Black. Thank you for uh, both super chats from uh, JQ, from Jamie, and uh, well, I guess three uh, from Samuel. Uh, again, these are <laughs> what keep what keep us afloat, what allow the Institute to have a publishing press, a journal, a website, all these uh, different things that we're doing to bring education to the working masses in, in as diverse a form as possible and meeting people really where, where they're at, uh, which means that, you know, for some people, uh, what they need is those one minute videos that uh, Eddie is, you know, a master at, at doing. For other people, they can hang out in, in longer streams and, and, and be comfortable with longer video format that's perhaps a little bit uh, more uh, developed. And then with other people, they enjoy the, the website and the articles that we are constantly putting up. With other people, they, they love the books, right? So the, the point is to, to bring people in from where they're at and develop them up to a point where they can systematically think about the existing state of affairs with a tremendous level of ideological uh, clarity and political maturity, maturity um, because that is necessary to, to win our fight against capitalist imperialism and, and, and win socialism. So in that whole process, uh, the funding that we get from you guys, the support that we get from you guys, liking the videos, sharing the videos, sharing the videos with people who, you know, um, you might not be too comfortable uh, sharing those videos with because you don't know where they're at. But, you know, that th those sorts of uh, um, those sorts of uh, interactions that you have uh, with the Institute really make the listeners and the readers a part of the Institute, a part of this growth uh, in, in Marx's education that we're trying to uh, bring about in, in our country. So I, it's it's good to see you. I'm grateful to see you live. Thank you very much, Samuel Black. And um, we're 20 minutes in and we still haven't gotten into the reaction video, but I think that uh, these interactions are, are still nonetheless very helpful. Um, hello, Odeka. Um, I feel like class reductionist is vastly misused. It is, right. It uh, It is. Uh, and it's, it's usually done uh, to those people who emphasize uh, the essence of the struggles that can be found in, in the struggles against racism, the struggles against uh, women's oppression, all these different struggles, um, and their, their class bases and how they're shaped by, by 
the capitalist mode of life. Uh, it's used against those people uh, in order to highlight the bourgeois, liberal, individualist, representationalist uh, parts of those struggles, which they have a role. Like in, in, in Nicaragua, uh, they have laws to ensure that like half of uh, the positions of power are held by women. You know, in Cuba, uh, it's the most sexually diverse uh, in, in, in the world in terms of like the political positions, the professionals. Consistently, over 50% of them are, are women, you know. Uh, so it's not that representation is unimportant, but under the conditions in which uh, we're in, it's not the essence. Uh, the essence of the struggle is the, the struggle for power, uh, for, for, for the conquest of political power by a multiracial and obviously multisexual working class. Uh, okay, what's your... What's your position on uh, the United Front uniting with other Marxist organizations? We're 100% in favor of it. We're trying to do it as, as much as we can. Um, we collaborate uh, frequently with, um, you know, uh, educational institutes like the uh, Critical Theory Workshop. Um, we're doing, for instance, a, a book launch for my book, uh, The Purity Fetish and the Crisis of Western Marxism. The book launch is uh, going to be a collaborative effort with uh, Critical Theory Workshop, with the um, International Manifesto Group, which is a really good uh, group. If you haven't checked it out, make sure to, to sign their, their petition. Um, it's a coalition, an international coalition of people fighting against American imperialism and, and for a multipolar world order. We collaborate with uh, the folks from Class Unity, which uh, were a faction uh, within DSA that uh, left a few months ago, uh, but that are doing great work on the ground, organizing working people in various parts of the country. And uh, of course, with, within our institute, we have a lot of people that are in CPUSA, a lot of people that are in PSL, some people that are in PCUSA, some people in FRSO, some people in DSA. So. Um, we're, we, we do think that it, it's the struggle for socialism is going to require uh, these coalitions uh, amongst Marxist organizations, which could mean that one group leads and, and functions as a vanguard or, or not. You know, it, uh, history uh, will tell us, uh, you know, what, what group does it and, and uh, if it ends up happening. Uh, likelihood is that, you know, it is, if you look at history, vanguards are, you know, necessary for these large social transformations. But uh, you don't become a vanguard when you proclaim yourself to be the vanguard, right? You become the vanguard when uh, organically the people see you as uh, as the vehicle for their emancipation and decide to follow you. It re requires gaining the trust of the masses, uh, providing for them, actually winning some victories, getting in essence, getting, getting their trust. And we have to be competent uh, to do that. We have to be politically mature. We have to be embedded in the working class. Uh, we have to be embedded in their culture. We have to know them uh, and be able to, from that knowledge of the working class and of our people, uh, which, you know, it's, it's, it's not just, uh, it has to be regional as well. We live in a large country. You know, the, the people in the East Coast are different from the people in the West Coast, which are different from Midwestern people and the people in the South. So you got to know your your, your people at, at, at a local level. And from that knowledge, understand what parts of the worldview that they currently have, which is fragmentary, it's incoherent. What parts from that worldview can you use to rearticulate them to socialism? Right. So, you know, in, in, in various parts of the country, uh, there's uh, definitely this ingrained belief, belief in the uh, ideals of the Declaration of Independence. Right. The right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, uh, the right to national self-determination, the right to revolution when a government doesn't serve its people, the right to uh, have a government of, by and for the people. All of these things um, are unrealizable under the current order. And it's very easy to see that, you know, when 60,000 people a year are dying from lack of insurance or from being underinsured, where, where's the right to life? You know, when the vast majority of Americans are in crippling debt, uh, a lot of it medical, a lot of it student debt, a lot of it debt for trying to get a home. And uh, it, it gets so bad that, you know, they, they can't uh, live, they can't buy a home, they can't uh, find tranquility. How can you pursue 
uh, happiness under those conditions? You know, what sort of right to life do you have there? Where's, where's your right to liberty when you're enchained by, uh, uh, by debt slavery, um, which Marx called the second form of the exploitation takes in, in the third volume of Capital, right? So in our history, in the history of the struggle for socialism, what you have found is people getting uh, those ideals from 1776 that a big portion of the population accepts and uh, using those to show the people that the practical and logical conclusion of these abstract ideals is socialism. And if you actually want the right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, you know, um, national self-determination, a government that serves you, that's of you and that, you know, uh, uh, that's by you, you need socialism. Right. And uh, these ideals have been quoted uh, by Ho Chi Minh in the Declaration of Independence uh, of Vietnam. They were quoted by Fidel Castro and History Will Absolve Me, a famous speech that he gives after the assault on the Moncada Barracks, uh, which is largely seen as the the first event that that uh, the first event that um, that embarks the the, mo the revolution that ends in, in fifty nine or that in a way restarts in fifty nine once it conquers power. So these are ideals that, of course, have not been lived up to <laughs> at any moment, and 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 that's more specifically true for for certain portions of, of the population. Um, but they're still uh, ingrained in in the core beliefs of a big chunk of the American people, and and those can be used to fight for socialism. So okay. Mm -mm. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, it's not that class is above X, it's that these struggles are already uh, inherently tied with class. Uh, hello, Terry Conley. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Okay, we have uh, one more um, super chat. Thank you very much, YHWH. Uh, call center workers are coordinating a strike for this May 1st, the first one ever made here in El Salvador. Uh, check trend, Mayo one, no me, me, me logueo. Um, thank you for that. So check that out. Uh, it's important to participate in proletarian internationalism to follow up the struggles of our brothers and sisters uh, across the world and to learn from those struggles and to support them and show solidarity with them. Uh, if there, if that's a like a, a trending hashtag on Twitter or something, uh, please do uh, send us a, a Twitter message with the sort of information that um, that uh, we we should be sharing to to spread this message far and wide. And maybe in in one of our next segments we can cover it a little bit. So uh, thank you again for the super chat. These are fundamental for 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 the institute. Okay, um, let me. So we'll get started now with this video from the School of Life, uh, which is ran, I believe, by Alain de Bottom. He's a philosophy professor. I forget in, in what area, but I, I know he's a philosophy professor. And uh, this video was suggested to us by one of our comrades. I thought it was going to be better than uh, what it actually was, given that uh, de Bottom is a, a philosophy uh, professor. But... Um, as uh, you will see, it's somewhat uh, disappointing. And uh, yeah, so let's get started with our introductory video and then we'll roll into the commentary on the School of Life video on Marx. So, let's see. <laughs>
injustice cannot be solved without a radical redistribution of political and economic power. All righty. Um, so let me set the screen up. Okay, now we're ready to rock and roll. Let me mute myself so we can start the video. Most people agree that we need to improve our economic system somehow. Yet we're also often keen to dismiss the ideas of capitalism's most famous and ambitious critic, Karl Marx. This isn't very surprising. In practice, his political and economic ideas have been used to design disastrously planned economies and nasty dictatorships. Nevertheless, disastrously planned economies, such as the Soviet Union under Stalin's collectivization, which was up to that point in human history, the fastest developing economy and the fastest increase in life expectancy and living standards that any uh, social group had ever experienced in human history, uh, surpassed only some years after by China, which even in the period of the Cultural Revolution, which the Chinese today consider to be a grave mistake, um, a mistake that should be understood in its proper context, it also had, you know, very many good things that went along with it. But even during that period of the founding, from the founding of the PRC uh, in 49 uh, to the, uh, to 1978, I believe, which is uh, when reform and opening up start, you have there a, a period of, of new democracy, the period of the Great Leap Forward and then the Cultural Revolution. In those years, the life expectancy of the Chinese people increased by more than a year every year. It was the most ridiculously impressive increase of life expectancy that human history had ever seen. And then following that, you have after uh, 1978 till today, which is the, the period uh, since uh, reform and opening up, China's economic growth uh, which has been just unparalleled again in history. So <laughs> very strange comments uh, to start it off, but just the sort of comments that you can expect from Western commentators, even those who, uh, you know, as, as he's mentioning, say that there's something that we, sh we can learn from, from Karl Marx. Uh, and of course, there's, that's right. There's a lot we can learn from, from, from Karl Marx, but the condition for accepting Marx or even Marxism in the West is rejecting those socialist states which have had to uh, tarry with in the incredible pressures of imperialist hybrid warfare in a world dominated by global capitalist imperialism and have had to construct socialism in those incredibly difficult circumstances. The condition for accepting Marx and Marxism is always the rejection of those socialist experiments, which in the name of Marxism lifted hundreds of million, uh, millions of people out of poverty. You know, just look at the example of China, which has eradicated extreme poverty uh, months ahead of the uh, of the time frame that they expected to 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 achieve that goal by. Uh, and in in essence, what they've done in, in, in the process is lift 800 million people out of poverty and drastically lift the living standards of hundreds of millions of Chinese people, all the while their international trade with the African continent. Uh, with the, the Middle East, which maybe we should call Northern Africa or Western Asia instead of the Eurocentric um, title of the Middle East. But uh, their trades with the Middle East and with the African continent and with uh, Latin America have been done according to win-win relations, where uh, these uh, areas of the world which have been kept poor by imperialism and colonialism and the capitalist mode of life over its last 500 years of, of existence, these areas of the world have been uh, developed by uh, China uh, and the friendly relations that China has established uh, with them. They've developed infrastructure, they build uh, bridges and, and roads and uh, things that are fundamental for the people in those areas and, and the lifting of their living standards and, and the bridging of the uh, gap and the inequalities that have been created in the international sphere by capitalist imperialism.
So if, if you know, we're what, 30, less than 30 seconds in, and we already already have the, the traditional anti-communist uh, propaganda that's uh, ba- largely baseless, and the parts that are true are magnified and synecdocally treated as the whole experience of socialism in that country. And the sad part is that a lot of the Western left accepts it. And uh, that's why I wrote this book, The Purity Fetish and the Crisis of Western Marxism, to explain the ideological flaws that lead them to accept it, why it is that from the basis of that acceptance and those ideological flaws, these people are not able to correctly understand the world and are also shooting themselves in the foot when it comes to organizing their working classes at home. It's the people that have been the most critical of socialism abroad who've been able to do absolutely nothing uh, with their working classes at home. So let's uh, continue the video. We shouldn't reject Marx too quickly. We ought to see him as a guide whose diagnosis of capitalism's ills helps us to navigate towards a more promising future. Capitalism is going to have to be reformed, and Marx's analyses are going to be part of any answer. Part of the essence of Marx's analysis of capitalism is that it cannot be reformed, at least not in the way that... uh, that the video is implying, right? Its flaws cannot be reformed away for any substantial period of time. The instances where you do see reforms under capitalism and and the ameliorating uh, for a very short period of time of some of its contradictions um, are in those moments where the class struggle has developed tremendously and working class people, usually within the imperialist core, where there's this surplus of resources that has been looted from uh, the global south via imperialist extraction and the super exploitation of their uh, laborers. When that condition exists where capitalism is reformed, it's something that is temporary and it is a concession that the capitalist class gives their working class, usually again in the imperialist core. uh, And it's a concession given with the hopes of not Uh, allowing a more radical transformation of society come about uh, with the hopes of putting a short-term band-aid on some of the evils that capitalism necessarily uh, creates. So in the essence of Marx's analysis of capitalism is to be found in the analysis of uh, contradictory value production, which necessarily leads, as Marx shows in the uh, three volumes of Capital and later on, uh, or in, in a separate project called theories of surplus value, uh, sometimes called the fourth volume of capital. What he shows is that th- this contradictory value production, this split that exists in the commodity, um, which is the essence of, of, of capitalism, the cell, the germ, those are terms that he uses to describe it. Uh, this contradiction then ends up manifesting itself uh, in all the contradictions that you see in, in capitalism. And once they all manifest themselves, you call that a crisis. So capitalism is crisis prone. All of these tendencies, all of these evils that um, this video thinks you can reform away by reading and understanding Marx are not, ref- you can't reform them away. The essence of Marx, Marx's analysis of capitalism is that you, you can't reform them away. That in order to get rid of them, you have to establish a socialist society, a different uh, a set of relations to producing the things that the human community uh, needs, a different state, a different uh, different series of, of state and, and civil uh, society institutions. That's the, the essence, really, of, of Marxism's critique. So we're not even a minute in. <laughs> and this has been a, a difficult video to swallow so far. Marx was born in 1818 in Trier in Germany. Soon he became involved with the Communist Party, a tiny group of intellectuals advocating for the overthrow of the class system. Marx got involved with the League of the Just, and uh, this was when he was around 25, 26 years old, um, maybe a little later. uh, And it was done with uh, Frederick Engels. And uh, upon joining within, I believe, a few months, it might be just a, a few years, they successfully did uh, not a coup but they uh, it, it was a sort of a coup the, the league of the just was ran by 
a lot of idealist uh, utopian socialists of the previous period. And uh, Marx and Engels called out this nonsense and they changed the name of the League of the Just to the Communist League. Um, to say that Marx joined a communist party implies that the sort of communist parties that you find uh, at the dawn of the 20th century after the split in socialism, which takes place in 1914, when the Second International Parties, the Right Opportunists, Social Sovereignist Parties, uh, endorsed the war, they endorsed the massacre of, of, of workers. There's a split, and then the communist parties erupt around the 1919s and 1920s all over the world. You know, to, for him to say that uh, Marx joined the Communist Party, it makes it sound like those Marxist communist parties that develop uh, in the 20th century were around before Marx. <laughs> and that, that's, uh, that's kind of absurd. And the abolition of private property. He worked as a journalist and had to flee Germany, eventually settling in London. Marx wrote an enormous number of books and articles, sometimes with his friend Friedrich Engels. Mostly, Marx wrote about capitalism, the type of economy. The stuff that he's like putting up, he's got, um, I believe it's the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right down here. That wasn't a book. Um, there was a manuscript that uh, pu was published, I believe, in the 1970s, maybe a little earlier. It was published uh, as a whole. Um, what was published at that point was the introduction. Uh, then you have the ma the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844, which, again, are manuscripts that he, he writes in Paris that are, aren't published until uh, the 1930s by the Marx and Engels Institute in Moscow. The Holy Family was published uh the thesis on Feuerbach weren't published until uh, Engels edited them and published it in his book, Ludwig Feuerbach and the Outcome of Classical German Philosophy. And that's th like three pages. Uh, so to list this with books, it's, it's kind of absurd. The German ideology uh, was for a very long time published in the 1930s, treated as a book. It was never a book that Marx and Engels uh, wrote. It was actually a collection of a series of articles that they were preparing in the mid 1840s for a journal that they were going to do, but uh, the funding fell through and the, you know, the journal was never able to materialize and the articles, uh, which they then tried to clump together into a book, uh, the, the proposal for the book was rejected and then um, it was never used. Engels goes back to it in the 1880s when he's preparing to write uh, Ludwig Feuerbach and the Outcome of Classical German Philosophy and he sees that there's a lot of stuff that's uh, outdated, um, but that it was somewhat helpful uh, in to, to reread some of that stuff in the process of him writing his more updated critique of the young Hegelians in that book. Uh, the Communist Manifesto was published. Uh, it's a short 30-page pamphlet. And then the critique of the Gotha program is a letter that, that Marx uh, writes that's long, that has been uh, published subsequently uh, as a manuscript uh, and a short pamphlet in, in its own right, but again, not a book. And Capital, yes, Capital is, uh, of course, a book. Um, the first volume of it was published in Marx's time. The second and third volume were edited uh, well after by Engels and um, Kautsky, uh, I believe. And Bernstein, I think Bernstein might have been a part of the editing as well. So again, uh, if, if you're familiar with the works that uh, are the, the key works of Marx, you, you understand that labeling this as books that he published uh, is very incorrect in a, in a wide variety of ways. Uh, of ways. Thank you, uh, Pacheco Ron, uh, for becoming a YouTube member. Uh, if you become a YouTube member, I believe uh, we will be giving you sometime this week an ebook copy of my book, The Purity Fetish and the Crisis of Western Marxism. Um, you also get a bunch of other perks that I, th I think Eddie knows the details of the perks a little bit better than I. He was the one who set it up. But uh, thank you for becoming uh, a YouTube member. Again, uh, these aids and funding are fundamental for, for the uplifting of the Institute and our growth. Economy ...that dominates the Western world. It was, in his day, still getting going, and Marx was one of its most intelligent and perceptive critics. These were some of the problems he identified with it. This is on the money from Leo. Okay, 
That's like saying Jesus got involved with the Christians. That's ex- that's exactly like saying that. And that's not to say that there weren't like communists uh, uh, before that, but they were um, what this uh, the, what the tradition of communist parties, which comes from Marx, would consider utopian socialists, um, as opposed to the scientific socialism that's developed by by Marx and Engels, and then further on by people like Lenin, uh, Mao, and and a whole host of others. Um, who are in the tradition of, of communist parties. Modern work is alienated. One of Marx's greatest insights is that work can be one of the sources of our greatest joys. But in order to be fulfilled at work, Marx wrote that workers need to see themselves in the objects they have created. Think of the person who built this chair. It's straightforward, strong, honest, and elegant. It's an example of how, at its best, labor offers us a chance to externalize what's good inside us. But this is increasingly rare in the modern world. Part of the problem is that... And this is, this is something that's quite uh, revolutionary when it comes to the history of ideas, uh, specifically in the West, uh, labor, and more specifically, manual labor, has been looked at very, very favorably. You know, Adam Smith considered it a necessary uh, evil that uh, you know the good part of of human existence begins once we're done with that sort of uh, labor, and that has generally been the case for for the history of, of ideas in in the West, um, with the exception of the people that have uh, considered in a very bifurcational manner mental labor to be fundamental that you find a whole lot of in the history of western philosophy uh but physical labor has usually uh, been uh put down and again the, again these splits uh, between physical and mental labor they're uh intensified by class society specifically uh, capitalist class society uh but it's it's really with i think hegel uh and then with marxism where physical labor is looked at as something that is fulfilling, as something that is fundamental to human agency, uh, as this process, uh, which he describes it as uh, externalizing, the term that's used uh, by Marx, or the term that's used in the translations is objectification. The human being objectifies themselves uh, in the product of their labor. They use resources from nature and then their unique creative impulse to make things which are done uh, in a way that uh, can even be in line with, uh, you know, uh, truths that are found in, in beauty and they can make things beautiful. Uh, and, and that sort of creative activity, Marx considered it to be fundamental to what it was to be human. Now, in, in 1844, it's basically a Marx before Marxism He's uh, still very young and transitioning out of. Uh, his Feuerbachian uh, phase, and uh, he's looking at this uh, alienation from the standpoint of uh, of the category of species being, which was a category that was used by Feuerbach. He felt that uh, human beings were also alienated, but the center of his analysis was on religion. We would alienate our, our, our species essence, uh, the human essence, basically. Uh, onto God. And so we would posit that God is all loving, um, all knowing, uh, all powerful. And those three characteristics, love, reason, and, and will, were really the essence of the human species. But because we didn't participate in them perfectly, um, and because we have the idea of perfect participation in them, we uh, alienate, you know, what's what's human into the holy family. We alienate it into religion, into God, and those becomes uh, those become God's categories, and that was the problem of alienation, as as Feuerbach said. Marx picks up some of that lingo in the early '40s, but he switches towards an analysis of economics, and uh, he goes to show that really the essence of, of alienation is in it's found in the process of, of production and how it is that we uh, produce the things that are materially necessary to survive, uh, which under capitalism are done under the logic of of private property and, and commodity production, uh, which entails, uh, he saw four central forms of alienation. I would add five. Um, there's one that he doesn't say it explicitly, but that's also there. It entails an alienation uh, from the product, 
of production. The thing we produce ends up becoming an other. It ends up uh, estranging itself from us. It ends up uh, disconnecting itself from us and obtaining powers of its own that then uh, reciprocally uh, turn against us. So the object, the thing that we create uh, ends up then becoming our, our enemy. We're alienated from the process of production. The, the process of our work is is one in which we are not in control of. It becomes an other, uh, and again, a hostile other uh, in relationship to us. So, I mean, when you go to work, you're not uh, the one that decides where you work, how long you work for, how you do your work. Um, you, you don't decide, you know, who the thing you make uh, is sold to for how much it's sold. You don't decide a whole host of things. You don't decide anything, really. Um, when you go to work. So we're alienated from the process of production. That's the second one. Uh, we're alienated from other people. You know, uh, in the working class, you your labor power is treated as a commodity. And that means that you're in competition with uh, your brothers and sisters who are also workers and trying to sell their labor power so that they don't starve and die under this absurd social order. So there's an alienation from from man, an alienation from humanity as well that occurs. Uh, and there's the alienation from our species essence. Part of our species essence, Mark saw at this very early uh, stage uh, in, in his writing, that the species essence, the essence of what it means to be human, is to be able to work creatively, uniquely, uh, in ways that are planned, in ways that um, that produce beautiful things to work on nature in ways that are also social, right? This is something that no other animal does. You know, the spider produces spider webs. That's an example uses in capital. The bees produce beehives. The beavers produce, um, you know, what the beavers produce. <laughs> and, you know, there's animals that labor and they produce certain things, but only the human being can produce uh, in accordance with planning and in accordance with, uh, beauty and in accordance uh, with a variety of different things that it can do. You know, these animals do one sort of labor. We can do a whole host of different types of labor that are conditioned uh, historically by the development of, of the forces and relations of production in the specific point in history in which we are laboring. So um, that is an idea that remains in Marxism, although the lingo of human essence or species being or species essence is removed there is a general idea that this sort of uh, human uh, Plato, uh, the, the essence of what it means to be human across uh, space and time, uh, cannot be pinpointed in ways in which like Western philosophy uh, does it. If we're going to look at a general characteristic, the only general characteristic we can find is labor. And uh, as a general characteristic, it is only definable in the ways in which it takes uh, determinate forms throughout history. So human essence, Marx and Engels and, and Marxism in general, sees it as something that's defined socially uh, and in accordance with space and, and, and time and the development of the forces of production at a specific uh, stage. So. That modern work is incredibly specialized. Specialized jobs make the modern economy highly efficient, but they also mean that it's seldom possible for any one worker to derive a sense of the genuine contribution they might be making to the real needs of humanity. Marx argued that modern work leads to alienation, entfremdung, in other words, a feeling of disconnection between what you do all day and who you feel you really are and what you think you'd ideally be able to contribute to existence. Uh, we have an advertisement there. Let me play through that. Um, but if you listen to that language, that's like not uh, very close to, um, to how it is that Marx is actually formulating his theory of alienation in the most abstract place where he, you find it, which is in those manuscripts of 1844. The theory of alienation is concretized and refined through the process of uh, Marx becoming and developing Marxism and scientific socialism and understanding in a more concrete and refined manner how it is that capitalism as a social totality functions, right? So um, if you want to read more on that, look at uh, this great compendium from uh, Marcello Musto is called Karl Marx's Writings on Alienation. It has a collection that goes from, of course, the uh, 
the manuscripts of 48 to um, to economic manuscripts from from the the 70s after he publishes Capital. I did a review of it that um, you should be able to, to find if you just look up my name and alienation. Um, so it, he's let's let's go back and listen to that part again. What you think you'd ideally be able to contribute to existence. So he, he's reducing the phenomenon of alienation to almost like a problem of auth authenticity. Uh, to a question of like who it is that you really are and what what you can really produce, what you can really uh, develop into, um, how you can actually find uh, yourself and develop yourself. And that's not really what the, the problem of alienation is. It, it is a, a problem of disconnection, um, but it's a problem of, of disconnection which occurs in various spheres uh, with, with various objects from which we're being disconnected from, which are all interconnected to each other. The object of production, the process of production, uh, other human beings and, you know, this category of species essence, which he ends up dropping. It's also a, a, a form of alienation from nature. Uh, and I think that if you read carefully those manuscripts, you also find that there's an alienation from nature. And if you look at the environmental dimension of Marxist critique of capitalism throughout his whole life, the question of uh, the relationship of, of social production and, and society to nature is, is, is always there even if it's sometimes in, in the background and not very explicit. So that's very different than, than what he's, uh, he's just said. It's, uh, and it's not like, you know, we got some comments in the last video that are like, you're just being unfair. These are very introductory videos that are very short and they're meant to be easy, easy and simplified. The problem that I have with it is that they're, they're simplifying to a point where it doesn't very much resemble what it actually is when a lot of these ideas are not difficult, he could have spent the same time he spent, which was like a minute talking about alienation. There's ways to distill the essence of Marx's analysis of alienation in 1844 into a minute and still be correct. Um, you know, Eddie is the, the master of making TikToks and, you know, he distills things that are very, very elaborate into one or two minute uh, uh, videos in ways in which yeah, there's some stuff, there's there's stuff left out, but the essence of what it is he's describing is still there. And the essence of what it is that Marx describes in Alienation is not captured by this short little segment that, uh, that the School of Life uh, has given to it. Modern work is insecure. Capitalism makes the human being utterly expendable, just one factor among others in the forces of production and one that can ruthlessly be let go the minute the costs rise or savings can be made through technology. And yet, as Marx knew deep inside each of us, we don't want to be arbitrarily let go. We're terrified of being abandoned. Communism isn't just an economic theory. Understood emotionally, it expresses a deep-seated longing that we always have a place in the world's heart, that we will not be cast out. I don't even know how the fuck to react to that. <laughs> you know, that makes communism feel like this sort of historical, like, mother figure that you're just like disconnected from capitalism and communism is like this spirit that just captures you and gives you a hug. It makes you feel secure and then gives you cookies and milk. Um, that's, that's, that's not a, that's not it. Um, the disconnection, the, the precarity that capitalism enforces on people, the, the problem with it is not necessarily that we feel that we want to be like comforted um, and we want, you know, this, this security. We do want uh, security, but th the problem with it is that it's a necessary component in capitalism. It is necessary for capitalism to produce a relative surplus population, as Marx labels it in the first volume of Capital. Uh, and that means that, you know, uh, you're going to have these uh, crises, which are determined, again, by that contradiction, contradictory value production, which is in the cell, the commodity form of capitalism. You're going to have these crises. You're going to have the stifling of humanity, right? The relations of production become a fetter. They become an obstacle to the, the development of the forces of production. And when you have a big chunk of people that necessarily have to be outside of uh, work that cannot uh, 
obtain employment and by not obtaining employment, you know, how the hell do, do they survive uh, under this order where you need to sell your labor power in order to survive, at least if you're a working class person, right? So there's a whole host of, of problems related to that insecurity that are more fundamental than just the way that he's painting it, which is as, uh, you know, we, we seek to belong and, uh, and we can't belong, we can't feel comfortable in capital. That is a part of it, right? It's not wrong but again you know there's there's more essential things to cover than just that workers get paid little while capitalists get rich this is perhaps the most obvious qualm that marx had with capitalism in particular he believed that capitalists shrink the wages of the laborers as much as possible in order to skim off a wide profit margin he called this primitive accumulation or now this part is just wrong. Um, this this part is just uh, verifiably, factually uh, wrong. Um, that process of bringing the wages of the workers' labor power down as much as possible, in order to have a, the bigger chunk that get, then gets realized into in, realized into profit. That chunk of unpaid. Uh, wages for the value that that labor has added to uh, the materials that uh, were there uh, through uh, machines that were also created by labor, that value added that doesn't go to the worker and goes to the capitalist, that's called surplus value. Surplus value. And that's why the capitalist buys labor power, which uh, what makes it special as a commodity is that it is the only commodity that in realizing itself, it adds more value to things. That's why the capitalist buys uh, labor power, because it could increase the capital that they own. And by increasing capital, it increases, again, the potential of realizing uh, that uh, surplus value, that uh, extra value that has been created by labor, realizing it at the point of sale and in the moment of circulation, realizing it as what we call profit. Um, it's not primitive accumulation. Primitive accumulation is a term that isn't even Marxist. The title of that last section of, of Capital, of the first volume, that's called Primitive Accumulation, it's phrased as the secret of so-called primitive accumulation. And that's a term from bo classical bourgeois political economy to describe that original accumulation which allowed for the development of, of, of capitalism and, and property and, and private property in the very abstract and universalistic ways in which they thought about it. Uh, Marx sees that the essence uh, behind the, the ground, uh, behind the development of capitalism, the conditions for the possibility of the development of capitalism, is this uh, initial stage, which has been called primitive accumulation, even by, by Marxists. I don't think that was the, the best term for it. But what it consists of is, in essence, expropriation and colonization. You have the expropriation of the commons through the process known as enclosure. We touched on this in the last uh, debunking intro to Marxism video. The process of enclosure begins uh, in Europe, can be traced back even to the 12th, 13th, 13th century. The peasants, uh, which are um, which are working sometimes uh, collectively, sometimes not, but they're working on the land. They own the tools that they're working with, so they own the means of production. These peasants are expropriated the commons so the commons where where that labor takes place for, from various uh, individual peasants it's uh it's enclosed it's privatized and those people are then the ones that become under the capitalist mode of life the relative surplus population uh there's various places where they go i talked about this uh quite a bit in the in the last uh video debunking uh, an intro to marxism video so you can go look at that if you want more of that history the second component of that phase that's called primitive accumulation, it's uh, colonialism. So as that development of enclosure develops to a certain uh, point, uh, you begin to have those European powers go abroad uh, into the Americas. The first expedition, of course, is 1492 and Christopher Columbus. And you have the colonization of America, which itself uh, ends up you know, opening new markets, finding new resources, finding new places to super exploit uh, labor, whether the labor of indigenous people when they're not uh, completely uh, wiped out or the labor of African people, uh, which are brought 
Uh, of course, in ships where half of them uh, usually died from how bad the conditions of those ships were, to then labor uh, in the Americas uh, for, you know, in horrendous uh, conditions. They also brought immigrants from, from, from Europe, indentured servants, which were basically slaves. Uh, you know, their living conditions were very much like the slaves. And early on, there was a lot of solidarity rebellions that included both the white European indentured servants and the, the black slaves. And in a way, the concept of race and racism uh, gets created in order to stop and and to stop those uh, rebellions, such as Bacon's Rebellion. Look it up, Bacon's Rebellion. It was a rebellion of joint uh, indentured servants and slaves. White and black uh, working class people, producers, stand uh, standing up together and fighting against uh, capital, against the owner of the means of production. In order to prevent that from continuing to happen, racism is developed. Uh, you know, there's a, a better conditions which are afforded to the white part of the working class, uh, including the removal of indentured servitude, the uh, development of free uh, labor in those areas, so wage uh, labor, and the ultimate subjugation of of the slave worker, the black worker, um, and uh, yeah, so that's primitive accumulation. That is not surplus. The phenomena he described where the, the capitalist uh, drives down the wages of uh, labor power of, of the laborer in order to uh, squeeze out the most amount of uh, surplus value. That's called surplus value. What's squeezed out. That's not primitive accumulation. Accumulation. Where is capital? But doesn't it sound super legit when you just throw the German, the original German words in there? Be careful of people who who are throwing in the original Germans, right? Because they know that that's what gets people to be like, ah, oh, damn, you know, this guy probably even read Marx in German. I doubt that this person uh, has has read Marx beyond like the maybe the Communist Manifesto or, or a few other uh, texts, the, the manuscripts of forty four or something, because. Um, had he engaged with, with the key texts of Marx, he would have noticed that uh, the, the first three minutes and 19 seconds of this video is filled with things that are demonstrably false. Capitalist sea profit as a reward for ingenuity and technological talent, Marx was far more damning. Profit is simply theft, and what you're stealing is the talent and hard work of your workforce. However, much one dresses up the fundamentals, Marx in and that's an important transition because at that point, Proudhon, uh, the, the French anarchist, was saying that uh, property is theft. Uh, he had this uh, major book, Property is Theft, I believe it's from 1840, and uh, um, Marx sees that that uh, property itself is an abstraction. Like, what sort of property are you talking about? There's no such thing as property in general. Right? There's different forms of property and different uh, that, that exist in different ways throughout different moments in, in human history. So, yeah, profit is uh, in, in, in a way theft because it's the portion of what the worker has produced, which instead of going uh, back to the worker, then gets sold on the market and realized as as profit. Insists that at its crudest, capitalism means paying a worker one price for doing something and then selling it to somebody else at a much higher price. Profit is the fancy term for exploitation. Capitalism is very unstable. Marx. Paying a worker one price for doing something and then selling it to another person at another price implies that that extra that's made, that uh, surplus, uh, that, uh, that profit, I mean, that it comes from the act of sale. And this makes profit and the essence of, of, of capitalism, which is the extraction of surplus value, this shifts the analysis to the moment of circulation. And the first thing, one of the first things that Marx does in Capital is completely destroy that notion that you can, that you have this, uh, that this profit comes from the moment of, of circulation. That doesn't mean that like merchant capital, for instance, uh, didn't exist, where people buy one thing in one area and then sell it in another area for more. But that's not the essence of the movement of capital as we come to know it in, in capitalist uh, commodity production. What brings about the capacity to sell one thing at more is the fact that the value of 
the original thing has increased because labor has been put in it. Labor has allowed for the value of that thing to increase. And the, uh, the, that increase is not given uh, to the worker. That, that is the theft that's in uh, property. And it is realized as profit uh, later on. It's proposed that capitalist systems are characterized by a series of crises. Every crisis is dressed up by capitalists as being somehow freakish and rare and soon to be the last one. Far from it, argued Marx. That's a really good point, because you still see a lot of uh, people who might be critical of capitalism. Uh, a crisis comes around and they're like, oh, it's it's this uh, specific thing and it's this specific thing. And um, it's that the banks did this. And um, and while that might be correct, uh, they're missing the forest for the trees because the essence uh, in the analysis of crisis would be to describe how it is uh, that this uh, tendency of the rate uh, of profit to fall makes capitalism crisis prone. And all of that is grounded on the fact that capitalism is at its core contradictory value production. That there's a split uh, at, in the moment of, of sale and purchase um, and it exists in, in a contradiction. That means a, a unity and struggle of opposites. And that is the essence of uh what you end up then seeing as a general crisis of capital. If you want to learn more about this, we had a wonderful, wonderful discussion on it with uh, the economists, Alan Freeman and Radhika Desai. I'm trying to find the video so that I can link it to the chat. Um, in they uh, specialize in crisis theory, and when the um, financial crisis of 2008 came around, they wrote, I think, some of the best papers explaining how it was that that crisis and that turn towards financialization, it's grounded on this long term of the uh, the tendency of the rate of uh, of the rate of profit uh, falling, and how this turn that we've been describing as neoliberalism and, and financialization that has been specifically central in the US and the UK, how that is grounded in this tendency that Marx had already seen and, and seen as sourced in this essence of contradictory value production. And they also critique many Marxist economists who have rejected this essential component of Marx's critique of capitalism in favor of trying to synthesize capitalism with certain assumptions of neoclassical economics. And if you want to learn more about that as well, I, I would suggest uh, Eddie's paper on neoclassical economics. And actually, let me link that uh, Eddie Liger Smith, neoclassical economics. He did a really good paper pulling from um, pulling from Cockshot and showing how it was that the philosophical uh, ground of neoclassical economics is um, very much like what develops afterwards uh, as postmodernism. So if, if you want to learn more about that, I put, I put it in the chat. So let's continue with the video. Crises are endemic to capitalism and they're caused by something rather odd. The fact that we're able to produce too much, far more. Shout out to the comrades from Orinoco Tribune out of uh, Venezuela. I've published uh, quite a few articles on their website and they do wonderful, wonderful work. Please do uh, check them out. Give them a follow on, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, they're in, in the same places where we're at. So please uh, check them out. They do amazing work. Um, a quick, uh, I'll try to answer this now, GQ. Thank you for the super chat. Again, uh, these are fundamental for, for the Institute. Carlos, can I get your thoughts on post-left anarchism? It seems like a liberal psyop but i think their straight edge belief is good no drugs um i'm gonna i'm gonna actually save it and and favor this comment and get back to it uh please remind me um in case i, I don't hit it remind me to go back to it so that we can finish this uh clip related to the reaction of the school of life video and then i'll get back to this question thank you for asking it and i will i will answer it more than anyone needs to consume. 
capitalist crises are crises of abundance rather than, as in the past, crises of shortage. Our factory. Part of the essence of these crises of overproduction is also the fact that uh, they're connected to underconsumption, right? It's it's the the overproduction part of it is uh, relative. It's relative to how many people can buy. It's not always necessarily overproduction in terms of how much it is that people need. Uh, it's overproduction in terms of how much it is that people can buy. Um, so it's at, at the same time uh, a crisis of of underconsumption. People have less of an ability uh, to, to, to buy the things that they themselves, as the workers who produce them, made them. The reason systems are so efficient, we could give everyone on this planet a car, a house, access to a decent school and a hospital. Thank you, comrade Big Meanie, for the five bucks. We really appreciate your donation. And that's what so enraged Marx, but also made him so hopeful too. Few of us actually need to work because the modern economy is so productive. But rather than seeing this need not to work as the freedom it is, we complain about it masochistically and describe it by a pejorative word, unemployment. We should call So he's right to say that where that Marx sees in the flaws of capitalism, tremendous potential for emancipation, right? The fact that the, the forces of production have developed to such a point where the crisis comes from an overabundance of goods in a market where people cannot buy those goods, that is somewhat positive in relationship to crises uh, of, uh, in previous modes of production where the uh, ability, the inability of people to consume was based on uh, the absence of, of this uh, development of, of production. So they weren't able to consume because there wasn't that many uh, things. Now we have the things to feed everyone, to clothe everyone, to house everyone, and, and people can't consume. But there is a positive uh, part of it, which is that we've developed to that point, And developing to that point means that we can have a qualitatively freer society, unlike anything else we've ever seen in the past. Um, if we change the, the existing state of affairs, the dominant social relations from capitalism to, to socialism, where the producers are themselves the one that determine what is done with what it is that they uh, produce. So this would be even freer than the primary or primitive communism uh, that existed before the emergence of class society, because they were limited uh, by uh, the things that they were able to produce. The forces of production hadn't uh, developed very much, and they were limited by uh, nature and, 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 and certain natural limits. Now the limits that we have to the development of the forces of production are related to our relations uh, of production. Capitalism stifles economic development, it stifles cultural development, it stifles development in every uh, sphere of life because things end up developing only insofar as they are profitable to a very small group of people. They don't develop uh, for the sake of uh, the whole of humanity or because it's useful. They develop when it's profitable. And that is a fundamental obstacle uh, for the progress of history. And just to, 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 to let me just repeat this last part, because it's, it's very easy to just, you know, go over it and, 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 uh, and not see what's being done here. But but also made him so hopeful too. Few of us actually need to work because the modern economy is so productive. But rather than seeing this need not to work as the freedom it is, we complain about it masochistically and describe it by a pejorative word, unemployment. We sh I wonder why. Why? why. Why is it that people describe the inability to get a job in such a negative light. Why is it that the word unemployment signifies something bad? I wonder if it has something to do with the fact that the vast majority of people under the current form of, of social life that we exist in, in order to survive, have to sell their labor power, which means that they have to be employed. I wonder if 
This problem is related to the fact that when people are unemployed, the likelihood of them surviving diminishes. No, it's probably just the problem of attitude. They probably just don't have the right attitude. That's the real problem. That's at least what the school of life thinks. It's absurd. You know, it, it, it's true. You know, these developments should be more freeing, but they're not because of capitalism. And the attitudes that people take to these developments are naturally going to not be, oh my God, wow, I cannot work and society continues. No, they're going to be, what the fuck? I've been fired. How am I going to feed my kids? How am I going to sustain my family? How am I going to, you know, sustain myself? You know, um, those are real concerns. And, and you know, the reason why people are not like, oh, wow, I can I can now afford not to work. And, you know, my, my family, everyone in my family lost their job. That means that society can keep going without me needing to work. Yay, freedom's here. No, freedom's not here. What's here is the anxiety of not knowing how it is that you're going to feed your family. Keep a roof over your head. Pay for medical bills. Pay for any emergency that comes up. That's what's here. That's why people have this attitude towards unemployment. <laughs> it isn't because they just can't see that this means that, you know, a, a greater potential freedom is here. It is in a way true. And that's what socialists should allow people to understand that as we develop the forces of production and technology, if we do it under a socialist society, it's not going to mean unemployment for the vast amount of, of, of people. It's going to mean everyone can now work less. And you're going to be guaranteed that in the hours where you're not working, what you find is what's called in, in, in Marxist theory, the kingdom of freedom, right? After the, uh, the realm of necessity, you have the kingdom of freedom. That's only realizable when uh, the producers, the working class, the peasants, uh, you know, whatever class is the main uh, producing class grabs power grabs power over the state and determines the course of action in economics, uh, politics, and, and every other sphere of society. should call it freedom. There's so much unemployment for a good and deeply admirable reason, because we're so good at making things efficiently. We're not all needed at the coalface. But in that case, we should, thought Marx, make leisure admirable. We should redistribute the wealth of the massive corporations that make so much surplus money and give it to everyone. This is, in its own way, as beautiful. You heard it here first, folks. Marxism is when you distribute the riches of the rich. It's not for, for forget about the writings from from Marx where he he basically argues that um, that socialism is when you change the relations of production uh, and that uh, modes of life ought to be analyzed by what the relations of production are. Forget the writings where he says that, you know, it is the moment of production that determines the other moments, the moments of distribution, the moments of circulation that determines, you know, the stuff in the superstructure of politics uh, laws, uh, philosophy, judicature, right? Forget all that stuff, right? What Marx is concerned with is getting the riches that the rich people have been able to accumulate and distributing those more fairly. As you can see by my tone, that's that's not actually uh, anywhere near close to what Marxism is. That's what, you know, the American people have been led to believe that Marxism is because they've been told Marxism is just when you tax the rich and you give whatever they have to the poor. No. Uh, Marxism is, is first of all, it's a worldview, but the struggle for socialism, the socialism that, um, that, uh, that Marx ideally en envisioned uh, would be when the producers, the relations of productions would be such that uh, the producers uh, would be the ones that would be able to decide what's done. So it's a transformation in the relations that exist in the moment of production. And only because of that, is it also a transformation in how it is that things are distributed? It isn't the case that how we produce things stays the same and then we just tax the shit out of the rich and take from that and give it to the poor. That distribution of the rich's riches, that's not anything that uh, Marx envisioned. Marx envisioned the relations themselves which produce those immense inequalities changing. Insofar as you're just distributing 
uh, the riches that you find in, in, in the pockets of people and, and, and what it is they, they own, you're treating the problem from the point of view of the effect. You're dealing with things at a very superficial level. You're just putting a band-aid. You have to go at the essence. You have to go at the root. And the root of that inequality that's developed later in the sphere of distribution is found in the moment of production and, and the relations that exist in the moment of production. And in changing those, you also change the outcome after. In just trying to change the outcome after, all you're doing is ensuring that the things uh, that lead to that outcome that you then have to change continue to to reproduce themselves and you continue to have to um, make these uh, very extraneous efforts in the moment of distribution to to equalize the share of, of wealth. Over that has nothing to do with Marxism. It has nothing to do with Marxism or with how Marx thought about socialism, which is itself, uh, it's, it's more than one way. You know, he's got the long-term view of communism as a society that's classless, uh, stateless, moneyless. So the interactions that people have are with the uh, direct uh, producers uh, from each according uh, to their ability to each according to their need. That's the long vision. And then you have communism as, you know, the, the dictatorship of the proletariat that's what uh, has since been called socialism, uh, which is there's still classes. Uh, the old exploiters are still around. They don't just get like massacred or anything. That's absurd. They're still around. They still have power. You know, as uh, Marx wouldn't be able to see this in the 20th century, Engels would, Lenin would definitely uh, see this. He'd be the, the biggest uh, uh, person in analyzing this systematically from the Marxist point of view. But you also have imperialism develop after capitalism gets to a certain stage of monopolization. Um, you have the development of imperialism as a stage of capitalism. And what that means is that the dictatorship of the proletariat doesn't have to defend from the national bourgeoisie that's still around and that's trying to lead a counter-revolution, but it also has to defend themselves from the attacks and the hybrid warfare waged on by imperialism. So that's another way that Marx talks about communism. And the other way, uh, which comes from the German uh, ideology, right, this compendium of, of articles for a journal that never got off the ground, is communism as the real movement of history which abolishes the present state of things, right? And that's, the, I think, the most dialectical understanding of communism. So there's, uh, there's this whole host of things, and in none of these do you find communism is just when uh, you distribute the uh, the wealth of the capitalists that they made through extracting surplus value and expropriating uh, and, and ex ex exploiting uh, working people. Beautiful a dream as Jesus's promise of heaven, but a good deal more realistic sounding. Why did they let all those people in? Why did the cops just kind of open the doors, lift up the ropes? Have those cops been charged? What was that? <laughs> We got to we got to get an ad blocker. I'm sorry for that. Is bad for capitalists. Marx didn't think that capitalists were evil. For example, he was acutely aware of the sorrows and secret agonies that lay behind bourgeois marriage. Marx argued that marriage was actually an extension of business and that the bourgeois family was fraught this is actually a good point, just because of how Marxism is misunderstood in the U.S., thanks to anti-communist propaganda. It's assumed that uh, it's just resentment towards what the capitalists have. It's just resentment. It's just poor people hating uh, rich people. And what we actually have to do is eat the rich, um, as uh, Comrade AOC uh, displayed in her dress to the Met Gala. But that's not uh, that's not the critique. The, the the essence of the critique is not you have these bad people who own the stuff, uh, and you have these good people who don't own it. Uh, the essence of the critique uh, says that it's the system. It's the system that creates these positions, like the one that uh, Elon Musk or uh, Bill Gates or George Soros, any of these billionaires, the positions that they have are created by capitalism which necessitates people becoming what he calls in cap in the first volume of capital, the personifications of capital, right? The, the agents that embody the actions that the system needs people partaking in, in order for it to continuously reproduce themselves. So the critique is not of these individual capitalists and their character and how greedy they are. 
The critique is of the system. And we understand the system as necessarily producing these things. If it's not Elon Musk, it would be someone else doing Elon Musk style things. If it's not Bill Gates, it'll be someone else doing Bill Gates style things. It's because the system uh, necessitates these positions, which are then taken by individuals. The essence of the analysis should not th therefore be the individual and, and how evil the capitalist is, but the system that necessitates people taking that position. With tension, oppression and resentment, with people staying together, not for love, but for financial. As a Cuban, I would say Goya. Um, and that might be unfortunate because the Goya people endorsed uh, Trump. And I, I know that part of the Hispanic community was uh, was boycotting Goya. But there's a slogan that Goya has, which is, Si es Goya, tiene que ser bueno. If it's Goya, it has to be good. So um, Goya might be the, the best seasoning. Of course, for the sake of um, legality, this is all a joke. Financial <laughs> reasons. Marx believed that the capitalist system forces everyone to put economic interests at the heart of their lives so that they can no longer know deep, honest relationships. He called this psychological tendency commodity fetishism, Waren fetishismus, because it makes us value things. Oh boy, this is the, the second time where he's used a definition for something that's just completely wrong. The first time was primitive accumulation to describe surplus value. Now he's just describing, you know, the psychological effect that capitalism has on capitalists as commodity fetishism for some fucking reason. Um, needless to say, that's not correct. Commodity fetishism is an objective process which occurs in, in capitalism because capitalism is at its core contradictory value production, the production of commodities, commodity production. And what it says, again, this is a lot more like the point on alienation, which he gave, which he, uh, gave is that social relations between people appear as relations between things. Commodity fetishism is not uh, something that, um, you know, that's tied to how much people uh, love uh, shopping, right? You, the, the problem is not something which you can fully understand if you watch Confessions of a Shopaholic or something, right? Commodity fetishism, fetishism is an objective process. I would even say it's tied to this other concept in the Marxist tradition called false consciousness, where people are unable to see the underlying essence and just see the, the superficial reality. And in doing so, reality itself gets turned upside down. So what is in reality a social relations between people that produces a product that's the result of the objectification of those social relations onto the world, that ends up appearing as relations between the commodities themselves, relations between the things. And it's a process which Lukács would, would later describe as a, a process of reification. The, the commodity gets thingified. They get thingified. They become a thing that's separated from the human, uh, the humans upon whose labor the thing's existence depended. So that, uh, uh, that uh, inversion, that topsy-turvy uh, perception that's created uh, in capitalism is not just a problem of epistemic hygiene. It's not just a problem of how it is that we come to know the world. You know, you don't fix uh, commodity fetishism when you know where your eggs came from or something. You know, it's an objective part of a social system that's grounded on commodity production. It is objective, and because it's objective, it reflects itself then ideologically in the minds of people in a certain way. And, uh, you know, you don't treat it through uh, ideological work on people's minds, uh, through removing the commodity fetishism from their mind. You treat it by removing the objective conditions which necessarily reproduce commodity fetishism in order for the system itself to, to, to be reproduced. So you treat it through revolution, through changing the relations upon which commodity production is grounded. You don't fix commodity fetishism by changing your psychological states and the way you think about the world. That's a big mistake that even many Marxists hold. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, what commodity uh, fetishism is, uh, I wrote a short article uh, describing it. Um, I also have a short article from 
from uh, Thomas Riggins, which is attached to the end of his book, Reading the Classical Text of Marxism, where he explains that last fourth section of the first uh, section of Capital Volume 1, which actually uh, gets included later on. It wasn't published in the first version of Capital. Marx didn't know really what to do with it. Uh, and then he decided to add it on later on to the version out of which the uh, English translations that we read now to the version that's uh, attached to that, which I believe might be the second German edition. Uh, I'm, I'm not too sure on that, but it wasn't in the initial, uh, in the first publication of Capital. Uh, it is in the one that we read now. Things that have no objective value. He wanted people to be freed from financial constraint so that they could, at last, start to make sensible, healthy choices in their relationships. The 20th century feminist answer to the oppression of women has been to argue that women should simply be able to go out to work. But Marx's answer was more subtle. This feminist insistence merely perpetuates human slavery. The point isn't that women should imitate the sufferings of their male colleagues. It's that men and women should have the permanent option to enjoy leisure. Why do That's true. Um, Marx and Engels, and more specifically Engels, um, was always incessant uh, in, in his engagement with the suffrage movement and the women's movement of the fact that although it's important to fight for, for this equality, uh, as equality is thought of now, real emancipation is going to come with socialism, right? Um, but they were in favor of these struggles for, for women's equality, uh, for, for these democratic struggles that partake, uh, are partaken in within bourgeois society itself. You know, they're very much in favor of those struggles. And as I spoke about in the beginning of the stream, they did see them as class struggles. Don't we all think a bit more like Marx? An the important aspect of Marx's work is that he proposes that there's an insidious, subtle way in which the economic system colours the sort of ideas that we end up having. The economy generates what Marx termed an ideology. A capitalist society is one where most people, rich and poor, believe all sorts of things that are really just value judgments that relate back to the economic system. For example, that a person who doesn't work is worthless, that leisure beyond a few weeks a year is sinful, that more belongings will make us happier, and that wealth while things and people will invariably make money. In short, one of the biggest evils of capitalism is not that there are corrupt people at the top, this is true in any human hierarchy, but that capitalist ideas teach all of us to be anxious, competitive, conformist, and politically complacent. Mar Maybe that part, Marx wouldn't, that last part, Marx wouldn't include, but it is certainly true that uh, for Marx, it, it, it is the case that, as he writes, uh, the ruling ideas in each epoch are the ideas of the ruling class. Each social order, each different form of class society, in order to survive, in order to materially reproduce itself, it needs to reflect itself ideologically in the realm of ideas, in the realm of the ideal. It needs to reflect itself in ways that uh, align the uh, the ideas and the beliefs and the aesthetic sensibilities and uh, the desires and the aspirations of people whose class interests may not be anywhere near the ones of the dominant uh, economic class, they need to develop a way to get those people to fall in line, to consent to the existing order and to its ideas, because that process of consent ends up becoming fundamental for the material reproduction of society. So it's ideology is something that is grounded in uh, economics. It's grounded in the economic base, but it ends up uh, developing what Engels called a relative independence, a relative autonomy, uh, which allows it to have reciprocal influence on the economic base and play this role that, uh, that makes it so that it allows for the reproduction of not only itself, but of that which produced it, uh, which is the economic base of society. Uh, there's a lot of debates around the concept of ideology in Marxism because there's the treatment of ideology as something uh, neutral, as just what Marx would perhaps more so use the term the ideal, 
as the realm of ideas that exist in every society. Um, in communism, the realm of the ideal would still exist. Um, and there's the treatment of ideology as uh, this insidious inversion of reality that's done for the sake of keeping people complacent, keeping people in line with the existing order, specifically people whose class interest uh, would be uh, in opposing, whose objective interest, whose true consciousness would be in opposing the existing order. And this uh, treatment of ideology is more so uh, within uh, the realm of what's called false consciousness which as the process that we uh, described with the commodity fetishism, it's an objective process that's grounded in the real life process of, of, of the existing order. And that only because it is grounded in the real life process of the existing order, does it reflect itself in a certain way in, in people's ideas. There's this famous passage from the German ideology uh, where Marx says that uh, if men in their real life process appear upside down as in a camera obscura, that uh, phenomenon arises just as much from the material life process of their existence as does the inversion of images on the retina. I forget that last part. But the essence is that the inversion is not in just in people's minds. The inversion is itself in reality, and it necessarily reproduces itself ideologically so that both the realm of the ideas and that objective realm upon which the ideas are grounded each reproduce themselves. So in that way, that's that's one understanding of ideology. The way that I treat it is that the realm of ideas uh, that exist in every society, I call it the ideal. That's what Marx uh, calls it in, in, in various parts of capital. That's what the Russian philosopher, which I appreciate, Evald Ilyenkov, that's what he called it. Ideology refers to a specific form of the ways in which uh, the ideal can invert reality in order to continuously reproduce itself. And it's a product of class society. And it becomes, I believe, the most nefarious and, and the most pronounced under capitalist class society. Marx didn't only outline what was wrong with capitalism. We also get glimpses of what Marx wanted the ideal utopian future to be like. In his communist manifesto, I already covered this a little bit, the three ways that Marx thinks about uh, communism. And I covered it in this stream and in the previous one. And uh, but just, you know, just look at the way that he's phrasing it. Marx's ideal utopia. The essence of, of, of what's new about Marxian socialism is the fact that it's scientific, the fact that it breaks with uh, the utopian socialism of the past, which were, you know, it was done in various stages. You have Campanella and more then you have you know, a different series of utopians. And then you have the, the ones that Marx and Engels talk about the most, uh, Saint-Simon, uh, Robert Owens, and Charles Fourier. And the essence really that, that defines all of those types of utopian socialism is the fact that uh, they're very much tied to individual projects of uh, uh, analyzing what's wrong with society and how would it be better. And in each of those cases, to a greater or lesser extent, the essence of the analysis is not placed on class or on political economy, and the essence of socialism is more so placed on the harmonizing of, of class contradictions as opposed to struggling against uh, um, the dominant order in a way that uh, centers class struggle. So it's a form of escapism. Things are bad. Let's make them uh, good through this other uh, world that uh, we can create. And so you have the development in the 19th century, and uh, most of them were in the U.S., of utopian communities, which were funded by these capitalist philanthropists. And the idea was to embody the communism that developed in the ideas of these utopian socialists, embody them in these communities. And they were very important for the development of what later becomes scientific socialism. But uh, uh, it, it is fundamentally different because the development of socialism is something that in their heads could have happened at any moment in history, right? Uh, if they would have been born 500 years before, they would have probably been able in their heads to develop the society that they envision. And uh, you overcome the existing order. You, 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 you achieve socialism by escaping. You achieve socialism by escaping, by creating something else. And the essence of scientific socialism, which is based on a, a very basic principle of dialectics, which is that you really overcome something not by going around it, but by going through it. You look at what is it in the essence of capitalism that 
can point the way towards a higher form of society that both uh, cancels out part of what you have now and uh, preserves other parts and elevates it to a higher form of social life. And that process is under is, is, is known in the German uh, word is Aufhebung. In English, is usually uh, translated to sublation. And uh, that is uh, really the, the essence of the transition into scientific socialism, the fact that Marx studies, Marx and Engels study capitalism as a social totality. They understand it concretely. And on the basis of that understanding, they can see how it is that capital within capitalism itself, the roots for a post-capitalist, i.e. Po- a socialist society develops. You overcome capitalism by going through it, not by escaping and creating something, you know, a commune or something. Um, so to, for him to be painting Marxism as his ideal utopia and, and to just use the word utopia is something that I'm, I don't think Marx, Engels, Lenin, anyone in the Marxist tradition would be comfortable with. Manifesto, he describes a world without private property or inherited wealth. With a... The essence is uh, always reality, the real movement of the world. And, uh, and not how it is that ideas can be cleansed and, and, and how these utopias can arise in our mind. That utopianism is a flaw, is a fundamental flaw of uh, Western Marxism. And, and I describe it in my book, The Purity Fetish and the Crisis of Western Marxism, where they, they treat socialism as these utopia, utopian set of characteristics, these uh, pure ideals. And if reality doesn't measure up to these ideals, reality itself must be condemned. And the purity of their socialism is sustained because it's not desecrated by the meanness of reality and of the reality of constructing socialism under immense pressures from hybrid warfare and imperialism. Um, So it's um, that utopianism certainly exists in in a lot of people who consider themselves Marxists, but uh, I wouldn't call them uh, Marxists because the, the soul of Marxism, the method, the worldview, dialectical materialism is absent in their thinking. And it leads to all these mistakes that uh, we, we have observed and criticized for the last uh, few years here at the Midwestern Marx Institute. Steeply graduated income tax, centralized control of the banking, communication and transport industries and free public education. Mar- they literally say in a preface uh, to a later translation of the manifesto for people to disregard this section where they're asking for demands, because those are demands that were based on the context of 1848 Europe, which was erupting into revolutions and which had very different conditions from, you know, 1873 uh, Russia or something, right? So uh, those demands that uh, he's now listing those are accidental uh, properties. They're not uh, the essence. Those are related to the conditions in which the manifesto was written. And Marx and Engels themselves said, disregard those. Those have to be adjusted in accordance to context. Yes, there are certain ideals, but like steeply graduated income tax. What? <laughs> you know, in some contexts, yeah, like maybe in the U.S.'s context would be uh, helpful for to, to get certain reforms and certain distributions of, of, of wealth. But that's not, you know, the essence of, of the struggle. So, um. Marx also expected that communist society would allow people to develop lots of different sides of their natures. In communist society, it's possible for me to do one thing today and another. That's that famous uh, passage where uh, in communist society, you'd be able to do a bunch of different things, fish, uh, in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, and, and do a whole host of things, whereas capitalism develops a, a very specialized form of activity for individuals, and it stunts their development as human beings by specializing them uh, in, in such a manner. But yeah, I think we can, we can probably finish up uh, with this video. Uh, I did have a question from, I believe, GQ that I wanted to answer. Uh, before we go, so let me let me get to that. Can I get your thoughts on post-left anarchism? It seems like a lib psyop, but I think their straight-edge belief is good. No drugs. Um, I I don't know what post-left anarchism is. To be honest, there's a lot of these ideologies that just 
develop online and, and, and just become proliferated. And uh, what, I, what I'll tell you is this. I cringe every time I see something that has post in it, with the exception of a joke that I have beaten to death of, of Post Malone. The only good post is Post Malone. Anything that sounds like post left, post Marxism, post humanism, post modernism, all of those things are just various various forms of what Lukacs called philosophical irrationalism, which whose analysis of these forms has, has been developed by John Bellamy Foster. We just interviewed him uh, last week, uh, so you can check that out uh, at, at our YouTube channel. The different forms of bourgeois irrationalism and their essence is in, to perform an indirect apologetics of the existing order, to present themselves as controlled counter-hegemony, as if they're the most radical and the most critical and, and the, the, the farthest left and, and, you know, just the most radical. Uh, but in reality, because they don't get at the substance of capitalism, what they end up doing is just uh, being a form of controlled opposition, uh, which is very much necessary for a capitalism that constantly is in crisis and leading mass of peoples to discontent and to, you know, coming out and fighting against the conditions in which they're in. If when they come out and see, well, how do I fight against this? They just see a bunch of post-Marxism, post-modernism, post-left this, post-left that, la, 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 la. That's the places where they're going to go. That's the places where the existing channels are going to throw them in. And those are the places where they'll get there and they won't oppose capitalism uh, at all. Um, they, in, in various ways, they'll be part of the entrenching of the existing order. And so this this uh, uh, controlled counter-hegemonic force ends up becoming one of the central components of legitimizing and, and perpetuating the dominant hegemonic force. So I, again, I, I don't know much. It might be uh, incorrect judgment. I might read uh, more about post-left anarchism and, and change my mind. I, I would, uh, I would bet the most vital parts of my body against that happening. <laughs> but um, yeah, be wary of anything that starts with post. Oh, thank you, Comrade Estar back. I love your your Instagram account. I saw Eddie mention that the other day, but you have some of the best posts. Uh, thank you uh, for for the Garrido Philosophy Hour. Yes, I, I I've uh, really enjoyed these. Um, I've really enjoyed these uh, streams alone, and uh, the capacity to interact with all of you, and it's it's uh, it's it's very fun. And I would like to get to the point where I'm doing maybe three or four of these a week. And as I mentioned last stream, we're going to be rolling into uh, what could potentially develop into uh, a university, a Midwestern Marx uh, university of sorts, where we would be able to train um, the next cadre uh, for, uh, for, you know, American class struggles, hopefully in a way that's, uh, uh, that's um, interconnected with all these other struggles that various groups are uh, engaging on in the left. But uh, we would like to have a classroom setting and the next, the, the most immediate uh, testing ground for that will be uh, Noah's Marxism 101 uh, class where we were, we're going to have a sign-up sheet for 25 people. I believe the last time we talked about it, we were going to offer it first uh, for our Patreons. And then uh, if it doesn't fill up with our Patreons, we would uh, post it in general for, for people to sign up. But it'll be a, a 25 people slot simply because we want the interactions to be um, to be uh, possible with everyone, and you can't do that if there's 300 people in there. So it'll be a Zoom class, 25 people there, weekly thing, two to three hours, uh, will be carried on for four months, just like any college course. You'll have opportunities to like write a paper at the end. Um, we'll select the best papers and and print them out in a booklet. Um, which will begin to be a sort of thing we do as we do more of these classes. Uh, various class uh, settings will uh, will include certain scholars, specialists in those fields coming in and giving a 30-minute to one-hour talk, and then the other two hours uh, after the scholar leaves would be Noah discussing with the classroom about the things said. So it'll be literally a, a Marxism university as we have it had have as we haven't had in the U.S. Uh, in at least a very, very long time. So um, we'll let you know uh, updates with that 
as soon as we concretize the last few details. But once we do the NOAA class, um, I'll probably have a class on the history of philosophy afterwards and uh, maybe a class on dialectical materialism. And, you know, maybe we can have some of the, the economists that we have in our institute do classes on Marxist economics and uh, certain classes on organizing. And um, Tom's got to teach. <laughs> He's been a philosophy professor for, for longer than uh, most people have. So um, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, the university setting, I, I think, might be something achievable by maybe the end of this year or next year, but uh, the NOAA class will definitely be coming up uh, soon within the next few weeks. Thank you, Comrade Ross, uh, a frequent uh, donator here. Uh, thank you so much for, for the 15 euros. And um, I feel the need to say this every time someone donates, but these, are, these donations are, are so fundamental. You guys don't know how important they are to keeping up the Institute, to helping us you know, have the confidence to continue publishing books, to, to take these leaps of developing classrooms and, and continuing to do these things and, and not have to be limited, um, you know, by financial restraints when really all the efforts that um, are related to, you know, at, at least my life, all the efforts are connected to uh, the struggle for socialism, to developing uh, socialist class consciousness and, and, and the mass of uh, American people, to fighting imperialism and fighting for socialism. I know that's the case also with, with Eddie and with Noah. So th thank you to everyone who can, you know, take the few dollars extra that they might have and, and, and send it to us. That's extremely appreciated. Um, but yeah, if if there's no other uh, questions, then um, I can roll out. Thank you all again for joining me on a late Friday night. Um, you have avoided the tempting vices that arise on Friday nights and have uh, engaged in, in what I think has been somewhat of a fruitful uh, discussion uh, teaching folks uh, Marxism. So thank you again for, for joining me and uh, we'll see you next time.